magazine. It had her idols on the cover, Donnie and Marie Osmond. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat what you said? Technical difficulties abound. Bear with me. <laughs> Christine was held the longest. After 19 days, a mailman in Florida saw something in the ditch sticking up out of the snow. It was Christine's hand. After Christine's death, police realized they had a serial child killer on their hands and formed what came to be known as the Oakland County Child Killing Task Force. Less than two months later, on the evening of March 16, 1977, Timothy King borrowed 30 cents from his big sister and walked three blocks from his home in Birmingham to buy candy at the neighborhood drugstore. He never returned. Less than two months later, as soon as Tim was reported missing, law enforcement canvassed neighborhoods on foot, helicopters with powerful searchlights scanned fields, alleys, and vacant warehouses. Oh, over the weekend, Al Brooks Patterson authorized police to pull over all cars on the roads in Oakland County between the hours of 2 to 6 a.m. Since the other three children had been killed right before their bodies had been dumped, it was hoped that they could intercept the killer and possibly find Tim alive. In all, 2,000 cars had been pulled over, but police had nothing to show for it. One officer did remark that not one person who had been pulled over had complained. Tips flowed into police. One of them was from a woman who was loading her groceries into her car that night that Tim went missing. She told police she thought she saw Tim in the parking lot standing next to, uh, talking to a man standing next to a blue gremlin with a white hockey stripe on the side. Six days later, with a kind of macabre consistency, Two 19-year-olds speeding down a gravel road spotted a flicker of red in the snow in the ditch. It was Tim's hockey jacket. His skateboard had been tossed nearby like an afterthought. Stoic and strong, Marion King was said to be particularly close to her youngest child, Tim. In a plea to Tim's captors published in the newspaper, she wrote, wherever Tim is, he is distressed about worrying me. He has always left notes or called to tell me where he is. After the funeral, at the funeral, Tim's teammates sat in the front pew, all dressed in their red hockey jackets, their shoes dangling inches above the marble floor. From a perch on the balcony, plain clothes police officers surveyed the mourners below for anyone suspicious looking. After the funeral, Marion became a warrior soldiering on because, as she said, I've got three other kids to raise. She wanted no part of the investigation. She did not want any media attention. Barry King abided by his wife's wishes. Sporadic updates from law enforcement, though devoid of any serious leads, led him to believe the police were doing all they could. After Tim, the playgrounds emptied. Traffic jams piled up at school dismissal time. No child walked home alone. Even playing in the backyard required parental supervision. Because there was no commotion heard, no screams of help, it was thought each snatched child went with their captor willingly, that they must have recognized whoever was luring them in. As a result, everyone became suspect. Teachers, coaches, ministers, cops, family relatives. Despite the largest manhunt in U.S. history at the time, and as many as 18,000 tips and close to a million dollars, the task force failed to make even one arrest. By December 1978, the task force shut down. The case gathered dust for more than 30 years. This is Livonia Detective Corey Williams. Corey was born in Berkeley, the son of a Berkeley police officer. Corey was 15 years old when the third victim, Christine Mihalik, went missing. Once Christine was snatched, fear spread like wildfire. Corey would lie awake at night talking with his brothers about what they would do to try and get away from the killer. Decades later, he would become the lead detective in the case, spending the last 14 years of his career devoted to solving it. 
This is Corey's father, Lee Williams. Lee Williams was a good friend of Christine Mihalik's grandfather, whose name was Bob Bell. The night Christine went missing, Bob Bell called his good friend Lee Williams frantic, pleading for his help. Lee Williams worked the case with a vengeance. Decades later, his son Corey would be on the same case, recognizing names of officers his father had worked with, desperate to solve the case his father could not. In 2005, Corey Williams was assigned to investigate a 13-year-old cold case murder of the owner of the Detroit Cab Company. While reading the old case files, Williams zeroed in on a suspect. Richard Lawson once drove a cab in Detroit for the cab company. As an example of one of the many serendipitous turns in this story, Williams happened to notice that Lawson had told some small town cops in Pennsylvania that he could give them some inside information on the snow killings in Michigan. Pennsylvania cops had no idea what Lawson was talking about, but to Williams, the words jumped off the page. Back then, the OCCK case was often called the snow killings because the kids went missing whenever it snowed. Williams now had two very good reasons to track Lawson down. Lawson was not only the man who murdered the owner of the cab company, he was also a prolific pedophile who knew an awful lot about the OCCK case. Once arrested, Lawson told Williams all about a child sex trafficking and pornography ring that was operating in the 70s in a 10 block inner city area just north of Detroit known as the Cass Corridor. At the time, the Cass Corridor had been hard hit by the recession. Once intact families lured to Detroit for jobs in the auto factories dismantled, leaving empty row houses in their wake Soon, the sex and drug trades established a lucrative home in the cast. Runaway kids ran wild. It was a predator's mecca. Lawson told Williams that he and others were prostituting children from the cast quarter to quote unquote, quote, rich auto executives in the suburbs. Williams spent three years unraveling a large multi-million dollar child prostitution pornography ring operating in the larger metropolitan Detroit area. It was a very structured organization broken up into hidden cells, much like the terror cells we think of today. Williams was able to identify local politicians, educators, auto executives, and even a state senator who was involved in sharing kids. Financing these child pornography rings in the Metro Detroit and on a private island in Lake Michigan was Francis Sheldon, a multimillionaire pedophile from an influential family in the Gross Points. In 1959, Sheldon purchased North Fox Island in Leelanau County near Traverse City. Sheldon would fly children in his private plane to and from the island. Once there, children were coerced into sexual acts and then filmed and photographed. Almost 50 years later, it is often said that Jeffrey Epstein is the modern day version of Francis Sheldon. This odd looking character is Gerald Richards. Richards was an elementary school gym teacher in Port Huron who worked for Francis Sheldon as his photographer. Police were tipped off to North Fox Island's operation in July, 1976, when Richards was arrested with sexual child abuse with one of his students. As soon as he was arrested, Richard snitched on his boss, telling them all about Sheldon's operations nationwide. Sheldon fled the country before arrest warrants for him were ever even issued. Because power and money can make a lot of things go away, Sheldon hid out and was spotted at various times all over the world. Over the years, his family and attorneys provided cover and Sheldon managed never to be extradited to the US. Sheldon is said to have died in 1996 of natural causes at the age of 68. Williams also found a direct link from the Cass Corridor ring to the Oakland County child killings through a pedophile named Theodore Lamborghini. Lamborghini helped shuttle children all over Metro Detroit to serve as wealthy pedophiles. Kids from the suburbs were considered quote unquote delicacies. 
Williams' investigation successfully put Lamborghini behind bars on sexual assault convictions involving over a dozen young boys. Uh, he put Lamborghini away for life. I'm not sure that I mentioned that. And while Lamborghini definitively failed to polygraph on the abduction and murders of the four Oakland County children, he refused to tell what he knew, saying, only God has forgiven me. In October 2009, Barry King, the father of the fourth victim, Timothy King, summoned me and my editor to his house. He was then in his late 70s, still practicing law. As we sat down, the first thing he said to us was, the story I'm about to tell you began in that big white house across the street where a friend of Tim's lived. Three hours later, he said, my family and I think we know who killed Tim. The boy who lived across the street was Patrick Coffey. Coffey was a childhood friend who had been so profoundly affected by Tim's abduction and murder, he grew up to be a polygraph examiner. In July, 2006, Patrick had just given a presentation at a conference of the American Polygraph Association in Las Vegas. Larry Wasser was sitting in the audience at that conference. At the time, Wasser was president of the Michigan Association of Polygraph Examiners. After Patrick's presentation, Wasser went up to compliment Patrick. As soon as Wasser introduced himself, Patrick said, well, I grew up in Detroit and in fact, the reason I became a polygraph examiner was because my childhood friend had been murdered in a very famous case. Perhaps you've heard of it, the OCCK case. At once, Wasser said he knew the case very well, so well, in fact, he told Coffey, I tested the suspect who confessed to killing your neighbor boy. Coffey instantly knew this was the break of a lifetime, and no doubt Larry Wasser did too. As soon as he said it, he likely regretted it. In divulging this information to Coffey, Wasser had violated attorney-client privilege, tantamount to career suicide. While Wasser immediately shut down, Coffey rushed to the nearest phone, ecstatic to tell the King family of this amazing revelation. All they had to do now was pry the name out of Wasser, but Wasser fought an investigative subpoena all the way to the Supreme Court the irony was lost on no one. Larry Wasser, the man who had built an esteemed career on discerning between truth and a lie, repeatedly went on to deny the conversation had ever even taken place. It took almost two years to determine the identity of the suspect Wasser had said confessed to the child killings. Finally, in late 2007, a name emerged. That name was Christopher Brian Bush. Christopher Bush was the son of a prominent General Motors executive living in Birmingham. During the time the murders were being committed, Christopher Bush had been charged and later convicted four times with criminal sexual conduct with a minor in four counties in southeastern Michigan, including Oakland County. But thanks to his wealthy father, H. Lee Bush, who was also the chief financial officer for GM, his son Christopher never spent a day in jail. H. Lee Bush hired a defense attorney and flew her around the state in a Bush privately owned airplane to arrange plea deals for her client. For all four cases, Christopher Bush was sentenced to probation. This is the Bush family home in Bloomfield Village. It was located within a five mile radius of all four victims. You can't see it from this picture, but the driveway discreetly and conveniently winds around to the back of the house to the garage. Sadly, the conventional thinking that the child killer was some monster from an outside area changed to something more sinister. Gregory Green was Bush's friend and fellow predator. In late January, 1977, Greg Green was arrested for sexually assaulting boys on the baseball team he coached in Flint. Under interrogation, Green said that Christopher Bush had murdered Mark Stebbins. When Chris Bush was asked where he liked to pick up kids, he cited in chronological order the three abduction sites where Mark Stebbins, Jill Robinson, and Christine Mihalik had disappeared. Tim King had not been kidnapped yet. It was only a matter of time. 
There is some discrepancy in the records over whether Gregory Green was out on bail while awaiting trial on charges in Flint, but no one can deny the resemblance of a police sketch from a witness who saw Tim King talking to this man. As soon as Flint police discovered Christopher Bush was from Birmingham, they alerted the Elton County Task Force and Chief Prosecuting Attorney Richard Thompson, whose signature you see here, rushed to Flint during a snowstorm to interrogate Bush and Green. It is worth noting that despite his own handwriting, insisting that Christopher Bush not receive any plea deals, to this day, Richard Thompson, the former prosecuting attorney who now heads up the Thomas More Law Center in Ann Arbor, insists that he does not remember the name Christopher Bush, nor that he interrogated him during the height of the crimes. He refuses to explain how the noose around Bush's neck mysteriously disappeared, nor how he allowed Bush to walk free. Thompson's boss at the time, Albrecht Patterson, also told me that he never remembered the name Christopher Bush. This is what money and power and influence gets you. For the same charge with the same boy, Greg Green received $75,000 bail and was eventually sentenced to prison for life. But Chris Bush got his $75,000 bail reduced to $1,000. He passed a polygraph and was let go. Weeks later, Timothy King went missing. How could this have happened, you asked? How could Richard Thompson not remember his abrupt change of heart from no deals to allowing plea deals that enabled a four-time convicted child rapist receive probation four times over during the height of the OCCK crimes? In keeping with the overriding theme of the OCCK case that money and power can make a lot of things go away, an anonymous source alleges that bribery, the age old practice of soliciting or receiving money in exchange for influence on the part of the Oakland County Prior Prosecutor's Office and H. Lee Bush is the culprit. What else would explain a $10,000 donation to Albrecht's Patterson campaign made by none other than Richard Thompson's father, Albert Thompson? Consider the fact that Thompson's father, a retired Ford assembly line worker, likely living on little more than $500 per month pension, could hardly afford such a generous donation. Also suspect is the timing of the highest donation ever made to Brooks Patterson campaign coffers. Federal Election Commission records state that the $10,000 was received on July 20th, 1977, just as Christopher Bush's attorneys were pleading for leniency, leniency in sentencing in his Oakland County court cases. We also know that Chris Bush's parents would do almost anything to protect their reputation, including bribery. Close followers of the case will recall that Elsie Bush, Chris's mother, tried to convince one of her son's victims not to press charges by waving a wad of cash at the 13-year-old from the window of her chauffeur-driven limousine. This would also explain why as Charles Bush told the FBI in April 2008, he found it curious that his father would shred all of his personal documents, including photos, passports, and bank records, well in advance of his death in 2002. Not exactly the actions of a man with nothing to hide. Oops. In late November 1978, a year after the child killing stopped, Christopher Bush was found dead in his Bloomfield Hills home from a self-inflicted inflicted gunshot wound to the head with a hunting rifle. Police maintained Bush committed suicide, but the evidence said otherwise. There was no blood spatter on the walls. His blood alcohol level 0.41 was lethal in and of itself and the sheets and blankets were pulled up as if he had been sleeping, not as if he had just put a bullet in his head. There was no gunshot residue on his hands, yet an unredacted version of this photo shows a bullet entry wound right between the eyes. 
Above the record turntable next to a print of a foreign city was a hand drawing sketch of a young boy scotch taped to the wall. This is that drawing that was on Chris Bush's wall next to the police sketch of Mark when Stebbins when he went missing. Ruth Stebbins, a single mom of two boys, Mike and Mark, had been struggling financially and thus had been unable to afford class photos of Mark. So the police did a sketch based on her descriptions of what Mark was wearing. The sketch on the right of a young boy wailing has the same coat that Mark was wearing, the same hairline. The ropes on the floor of the walk-in closet was yet another prop. So too was the presence of a single 12 gauge shotgun shell in Bush's desk, consistent with the caliber of gun used to shoot Joe, shoot Joe Robinson. Altogether, the scene looked staged and yet Bush's body was cremated two days later. Six months later, the house was sold. A month after Bush's death, the task force closed up shop saying it had run out of money. In October 2009, I broke the Chris Bush lead in the, in the Detroit News. It was the first time most everyone in the community had heard about the son of a prominent GM and executive in connection with the OCCK case. I say most because there had been rumors, what Barry King called a suburban legend, about police not being able to touch a pedophile living in Birmingham because of his family's reputation. In fact, a few days after the Detroit News article appeared, a friend of Tim's knocked on Barry's door and told them all about a conversation he had had with a Birmingham cop in the early 90s. The cop told him not to worry, that it had been taken care of. The cop said someone came to the police department sometime in late 1977 or 78 saying that they represented a prominent family in Birmingham. The father was a GM executive and, exchange, and in exchange for the Birmingham Police Department not pursuing it, the family said they would be willing to institutionalize their son on their own dime so that he can never commit any more crimes. Indeed, on the anniversaries of the crimes, when reporters would circle back to their police sources to ask why the case had never been solved, police responded in a strikingly similar fashion, as you can see here. The party line was, suppose the killer was from a wealthy family and they sent him away to treatment for life. Sadly, it would take decades for the public to discover just how closely this theory aligned with real events. But by then it was too late. Witnesses had died off, memories had faded, and all of the evidence was either lost or destroyed. This is John Hastings. John Hastings grew up one street away from Chris Bush's home. His father was also a big auto executive. Chris and John were the same age. They were said to have been short order cooks together at Biff's, a popular local diner. John Hastings used to like to brag about how much he knew about the OCCK case, and he did know a lot. Enough, in fact, to make him fail a polygraph on the case in 2009 so miserably, the polygraph examiner said there was no question that Hastings had some involvement, but police have yet to follow up with him. Here's another person of interest that needs pursuing. This is James Vincent Gunnels. Gunnels was 13 years old when he was molested by Christopher Bush and Gregory Green. And while Gunnels was definitely a victim, he is also thought to have been a lure in the car, young enough to perhaps attract little kids to come closer to the passenger side window. In March 2009, Vince Gunnels' mitochondrial DNA was found to have the same profile consistency as a hair fragment found on Christine Mihalik's sweater. Shortly thereafter, Vince failed to polygraph on Christine Mihalik's abduction and murder. But Vince Gunnels refuses to talk about what he knows. He has said he has no idea how that hair connected him to Christine. This is Arch Sloan. Arch Sloan is a lifelong pedophile who was sentenced to life in prison in the 80s for the rape of a young boy and he's been there ever since. Sloan was looked at as, as a suspect in February 1976 when Mark Stebbins' body was found. When the local TV news ran the story about Mark's death, Sloan probation officer was watching 
He called Southfield police and suggested that they take a look at Sloan. So they did. They questioned Sloan and they also impounded his vehicle, a burgundy Bonneville with a black top. They recovered hairs and fibers from his Bonneville. They put them on slides, but these slides would not be carefully considered for 35 years, not until Detective Corey Williams and his boss, Wayne County Prosecutor Kingworthy, brought pressure to bear on the Michigan State Police Crime Lab to organize, finally, label, process, and all the old physical evidence for DNA forensic study. In 2009, Detective Sergeant Corey Williams briefed Oakland County Prosecutor Jessica Cooper, former Oakland County Prosecutor Jessica Cooper, on all the evidence he had amassed against Christopher Bush and Greg Green, but she was not impressed. Thereafter, she downplayed the Chris Bush lead and said, we don't charge dead people. She fought Barry King's FOIA request for the Chris Bush files all the way to the Supreme Court. She succeeded in having Williams removed from the task force twice, and she suggested that Barry King, the father of a victim of a murdered child, was senile. Around November 2009, Cooper decided to take the reins of the investigation by forming what she called a quote unquote newly reconstituted task force. After all, Cooper said, it is the Oakland County child killer case. Two months later, in January 2010, blockbuster DNA evidence connecting hairs found on the bodies of Tim King and Mark Stebbins were found to be consistent with a hair found in Arch Sloan's Bonneville. Those three hairs belong to the same person. It has been said that whoever shed those hairs, one in Sloan's car, one on the first victim, and one on the last, is our killer. This was huge, the strongest scientific evidence in the case ever to emerge. And yet, these DNA results were only known by a chosen few. Both Detective Corey Williams and Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy, Williams' boss at the time, were told the evidence didn't exist. Nothing had come back from the FBI lab in Quantico. For more than nine months, this false head was kept alive by the leaders of the quote unquote, Oakland County Child Killing Task Force, presumably so they could take the ball into the end zone. For all intents and purposes, the investigation had been hijacked out of pure political ambition so that only one law enforcement agency, Oakland County, would have a better chance of solving one of the most notorious cases in Michigan history. Wayne County was forced to subpoena fellow officers of the law to appear in court and release the DNA as results they had earlier insisted did not exist. This is what Arch Sloan looks like today. He's been offered early release on a tether in exchange for information that will help solve the case or that could help solve the case, but he refuses to talk. Investigators are convinced he knows something. He failed a polygraph on Tim King, but he cannot figure out how not to implicate himself. Apparently being identified as the Oakland County child killer is worse than being behind bars for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, like so many other suspects in this case, he will take his secrets to his grave. I'll end uh, with just a few short points, um, sort of my theories um, about why the case was, was never solved. Um, uh, and there are certainly many, 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 many reasons, but it, if I had to narrow it down to one reason, I would suggest that the cover up is largely to blame for the case not being solved, specifically the cover up of the suicide scene. The, it was so staged, the task officers that were on the scene at the time well remembered all the blatant evidence that was laid out like central casting. One officer told me, we thought for sure this was the guy. We just assumed that the head of the task force was going to take all the evidence back to headquarters and process it. But instead, as soon as law enforcement realized that they had arrested Christopher Bush in January 1977, but then let him go, 
only to have Tim King go missing weeks later. Someone high up in the, in the task force decided to bury the Chris Bush files. They could not risk letting a terrorized community know that they had committed a grave error, that the investigation amounted to something worse than a massive investigative failure. It was sabotaged, the most critical evidence deliberately concealed. Remember that we were never supposed to know about Christopher Bush. Had that conversation between two polygraph examiners, one a childhood friend of Tim King's, never have taken place. We would not be sitting here. I would not have written this book. No one would have ever known about Christopher Bush. And that was all by design. His family wanted to protect their reputation. And the task force at the time did not want the community, community to know that they quite possibly had blood on their hands. Um, secondly, uh, uh, this case will be solved one day, I believe, either by advances in DNA science or better yet, by people coming forward. Since my book was published, we've had um, um, people coming forward with really strong tips about things they saw. We've also had victims come forward, victims of the child pornography rings that were active in the 70s. And we've been able to make connections between what happened to them and the OCCK case. So it's very encouraging. Um, lastly, there's a, a big project underway. A group of volunteers are working on a website that um, will include an open source repository and archive of all of the case documents so that the public can view and search and analyze, and maybe even with fresh eyes, make connections that others have missed. It's exciting because at long last, the case that has been so poisoned by cover-ups and bureaucratic secrecy now has a shot at transparency. And because we know that truth dies in darkness, the memory of these four kids deserve nothing less. So, oh, Corey, I see Corey's here. And um, maybe uh, we could answer some of your questions now. Sure. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, we have a question from Art Helens. His question is, the one Oakland County child killer sketch shown earlier beside Greg Green shows much, shows much more like Hastings face. Furthermore, that sketch seems to be much more clear and detailed than the original OCCK sketch, although very similar. Where did this sketch come from? Marnie? Yeah. Me to address that? Sure. sure. Okay. I think that's... Go ahead. Our, um, I can tell you that over the course of the investigation early on, there was as many as 13 to 14 uh, sketches drawn from different witnesses from different locations. And unfortunately, some of the sketches, we don't know the, the source, the witness, the source of the witness or the <laughs> details of where they came from. So, you know, <laughs> it, I'm sorry to say that we used to talk about it. Um, as a group of detectives when I was working the case that there was a literally a sketch in the file that could look like any one of the suspects. So uh, the one that Marnie presented is probably the most uh, common one seen in this case. And that was drawn from the woman at uh, the pharmacy or grocery store in Birmingham when Tim was abducted. Um, and yeah, it could, it looks kind of looks like Hastings. It kind of looks like green. It could look like just about anyone if you wanted it to, that's the problem. So sketches can point you in the right direction. And when you make an arrest with concrete evidence, you can say, wow, okay, that's the guy in that sketch. But to identify people through the sketch is really tough to do. So a question from Cindy C who asks, what can we do to pressure those 
and can solve the case. Um, the only way to prevent what happened in this investigation from happening again is, is to hold um, is to hold people accountable for their misdeeds. Even if they're dead, there needs to be um, there needs to be a public accounting of, 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 of what went on here and who was involved in, 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 in covering up um, this, this really important evidence, um, even if they are long gone. Um, uh, I'm for a, a long time, um, the Michigan State Police and, and maybe Corey, you might may or may want to speak to this, has been inactive on the case. Uh, I've had um, numerous calls from people that have tried to uh, reach the task force um, tip line and it's it's closed down. I've tried to um, get interviews with the with the head of the task force as recently, I mean, over the years and as recently as as uh, two months ago and was was told that the task force is not doing interviews. Um, that just isn't right. Um, I, I'm really happy to report that um, uh, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office is, um, is investigating, um, actively investigating the case. Um, when others, we, we, we can't, when I say we, I mean um, Kathy King Broad, the sister of the fourth victim, um, presented a bunch of leads um, to uh, uh, to the Attorney General's office. Um, I went to the FBI, um, uh, but and we also went to the Oakland County Prosecutor's office. But the one who's really picked it up, um, not surprisingly, is is the Wayne County Prosecutor's office. So, I Marnie, have, I can add to that. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, anyone that's live with us right now, if you have information you think might help or you're not sure might help, please contact Detective James Bivens, B-I-V-E-N-S, at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. I worked with him for many, many years on this case, and he's actively following leads and interviewing witnesses and would be happy to hear what you have to tell him. So please call James Bivens at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Um, been a detect he's been a detective for many years, probably close to 50 years, retired from Detroit Homicide and uh, very active in the current investigation. I can also say that uh, Oakland County Prosecutor McDonald is receptive to what we're trying to do and move forward. And please contact them as well. If you live up in Oakland County and feel more comfortable talking to them, please call her office and ask for one of her detectives if you have information regarding this case. Thank you. You can also email me or, or um, go to my website, which is the snowkillings.com. And if you subscribe to my mailing list, you can send me a um, an email that I'll, I'll go to my personal email and I can, I can uh, pass everything on to James Bivens as well. Um, and thanks. We just, we, we, this can't die in silence and it, and silence is complicit. We all know that. Yeah, so I would like to, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I'd just like to say that for those that have read Marnie's tremendous book, it was very detailed and she, I can't thank her enough for doing such a great job putting such a complex investigation into, into a book that's easy to understand for the most part. Um, it was, <laughs> it, that was quite a feat to do that, Marnie. And uh, 
I think that uh, based at, if, if you really want to know the case, read the book, get up to speed on what, where we were and where we finished in 2019, not finished, but where I left off. And hopefully we can keep moving forward. This case can be solved. I'd love to yeah. say that. I'm happy to say that it can be yeah. solved. Yeah. I think that we've identified the major players in this case. I call them players, major suspects. I think they've been identified. We just need the pieces of the puzzle to prove it. And the ones that are alive, put them behind bars. Thank you, Mike. Sorry. Yeah, someone had asked about uh, perhaps Attorney General Dana Nessel getting involved. Is she receptive to? to... Um, uh, over ahead, the Marie. spring, Kathy and I uh, had a um, Zoom meeting with um, three people in our office um, and uh, presented um several leads uh that we felt really needed to be investigated you you should know that corey retired in 2019 so what i've often said that um uh one of the worst things that happened to the investigation was when he retired because um we had no one to to um, pick up these leads that were coming um we did um, you know, have this this Zoom meeting, and and I'm sorry to say that not much action came of it. Well, let me uh, add to that. Because, yeah. <laughs> yes, I did retire in 2019, and I went to work for the Archdiocese of Detroit. So I'm doing that right now part time, um, but I'm also available for James Bivens and for the state police and for the FBI and for the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office, anyone that wants to talk to me about this case, I'm happy to do that. And I, I kept notes, copious notes for the entire time I investigated this case. Marnie can attest to the fact that <laughs> I tried to keep pretty detailed notes, probably over 500 pages. Yeah. of type notes um, so that detectives could not skip a beat and have to duplicate effort and could hit the ground running and keep the case moving forward in case I didn't solve it. And uh, I hate the word solve. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a matter of identifying people. Some of the suspects, I believe, will, people involved in this case are going to be dead. Some will be alive. And I'm sure there's a lot of non-finger pointing going on based on who's alive and who's dead. But uh, we shall see. Hopefully. Next question. Next question from Laura asks, do you have any autosomal DNA samples that could be entered into GED match? Do you wanna take that, Corey? Sure, yeah, unfortunately we do not have, well, I hate to say that, we have, mitochondrial DNA that hopefully with new technology, we've just started to learn. I, I got a call from the state police this summer asking about which evidence we should send to some private labs that we're offering to help in this case free of charge, which the state police, I'm sure that thrilled them because they're on a budget. Um, <laughs> but uh, they were offering to their assistants to claiming that they could possibly turn mitochondrial DNA into autosomal DNA, which is wow. based, autosomal is nuclear, yeah. which could identify a single suspect, which is new technology. That's especially wow. since I was working the case. So um, no guarantees, but it's exciting to hear that. Wow. Corey, there's a question for you from Mike Tenreg. He says, you work with your brother, Mark, in Berkeley. Were you on this case when that message scrawled on the window at St. Lassalette was found? Tell us what that means. I, I'm familiar with that, Mike. Thank you. Um, I remember my brother telling me about that, and I think I heard about that when I was working the case about Lassalette in Berkeley. Um, 
I'd have, <laughs> he's catching me off guard with this question, but I'd have to go back to my notes to remember exactly the follow-up on that was done on that. And I, I would guess that Ray Anger, the Berkeley detective at the time, would have followed up on that information. And I believe he did. I just don't remember the results of that, but I do remember that happening. Yes. Wasn't there a Berkeley police officer commit suicide there during this time? Yes. Was that related yeah. to this? It's Chris Flynn. Yeah, he was actually my dad's partner. And uh, I remember I was probably 18 years old or 19. And we were up north at a cottage. My dad and I and my brothers deer hunting when my mom called and said that Chris had committed suicide. And we knew Chris well. My, my dad was training him as a detective in Berkeley. And our families had gone on a couple trips together and very sad. And I had no idea that 35 years later, I'd be investigating Chris as a suspect in this case and interviewing my mom about him. <laughs> to your credit <laughs> that you did that. Ah, thanks. Elizabeth wants to know, and you just mentioned uh, the Wayne County investigator was, was uh, Nivens. She wanted for a number to call for a tip. Oh, James Bivens. And she can just call the direct line at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office and ask for Detective Bivens. They'll connect her. Thanks, Thanks Mike. B-I-V-E-N-S. Yes. Question from Brian. He has a couple of questions. Did you learn anything about General Motors Contemporaneous Intelligence Division during your research into the case? Sheriff Spreen described this division as powerfully influential and insular, operating somewhat beyond the law. I've never heard of it. Con it it's contemporaneous. GM's Contemporaneous Intelligence Division. Contemporaneous Intelligence Division. That's a new one. Um, I've never heard of it. There was rumors, I believe, in your book, Barney, that, that talked about possible uh, uh, GM, allegedly GM people using children. Yes, yes. Very, very hard to, to track down and, and, and to prove, but yeah, there were rumors. Well. And some of the survivors of the rings yeah, I, I talked to survivors that had been prostituted out in Oakland County to the executives. Right, right. And uh, and they told these boys at the time that they were GM executives at their home while while they were at their homes. Is there any information other than the incident reports regarding Green's life in California? The number of his offenses indicates an operation. And many of the figures central to the international child pornography at the time were headquartered there. Green being connected to the international child pornography ring operating in California. Yeah, any, any entirely possible, right, Corey? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know. The connection with the pedophiles back then in, in the 1970s was obtaining child pornography. That's mm -hmm. how they connected because it, there was a, a, a secret organization to be able to um, obtain that sort of information and photographs and, and to speak and connect with each other. It wasn't like today, like get on the internet and talk to each other. Right. Yeah. So it's very possible. Whatever became of Fox Island, uh, the individual named Sheldon owned it, but he disappeared and allegedly died later. Um, who owned well, he, it? well, the state of Michigan took over ownership of the island. Um, Francis Sheldon fled the island under indictment in 1978, fled to, I believe it was Antigua. He was and then, Pardon me? 
he was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, ended up in Amsterdam yeah. and financing child porn production there and uh, died of AIDS in 1976 in Amsterdam. This question is for both Marty and Corey. Are the, and this is from Jeremy. Are the whereabouts of James Vincent Gunnels known? I read a while back that he disappeared from sight. Any chance anyone could get him to open up about what he knows? <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, pardon me, Marnie. Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> interviewed James Gunnels many times, career criminal, um, doesn't trust the police, doesn't trust anyone. Um, Hung, was hanging with Bush and Green back in the 70s, uh, was a victim and also, I believe, a co-conspirator in our case. He, <laughs> if you read the book, he uh, failed, he skewed the polygraph on purpose to get an inconclusive originally, then fled to Mon Montana under parole his DNA ended up matching off Christine Mihalik's coat. I shouldn't say matching. I should say he could not be excluded from the DNA on the coat, which um, could have been one in hundreds of people, but still went to Montana. He denied everything. I told James finally, take the polygraph without screwing around or we're going to be messing with you the rest of your life. If you want to be rid of us, take it without messing with it. Take it straight up. So he agreed. We brought him back to Michigan. He took it. We polygraphed him solely on the disappearance and murder of Christine Mihalik. He failed it miserably. Um, I went back in 2019 before I retired <laughs> to Montana where, Vin, where uh, Vince's brother was living in Butte, Montana and interviewed him. And the brother said, I believe Vince knows something. I think he saw one of those girls or was with one of those young girls. And that's why he can't pass a polygraph. He's so afraid that he's gonna be named as the killer. Yeah. That, that he can't get himself out of the way. And so it, it's a tough case. I mean, it's very complicated. And there's too many, there's so many people involved. It makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. There are, and I do want to condemn Marty. It's a terrific book. There's a lot of information in there. I saw one of our, uh, our guests or one of our participants said, you've read it a few times because there's so much information in here. Uh, I want to let people know that if you try to pull out, this, this book's got to be available on Amazon, I'm guessing. And uh, Detroit Public Library has a number of books available for any EPL card holders. Either one of you two, uh, any last words? Uh, thank you so much for doing this, um, Mike. I, um, you know, I published the book in the middle of the pandemic and it's very difficult. <laughs> it's been very difficult to get the word out. And, and um, we please, please keep this case alive. Please talk about it. Um, uh, please get in touch with me, you know, via my website. We, we can, we can, we can open up some doors here. We, uh, we can maybe not solve it, but at least we can, we can come to some sort of resolution together about what what really happened here and the only way we can do that is if people continue to talk and and be involved um so i i have i have so much gratitude for the libraries because the libraries have been hosting these zoom presentations ever since i published and it's real been a real lifesaver for me so thank you I'd just like to thanks, add that. Corey. Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks, Marnie. Really? I'd just like to add, let's keep the torch burning right. for these four kids and for any kids in the future. But it's so important to, yeah. if you have information and you, you don't know whether it's important or not, there's people that do know whether it's important. And that's the detectives involved. We know, and we can decipher. 
So please don't hesitate to call. And Mike, thank you. And let's everyone keep keep this going. Again, to both you and our participants, we, we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Much. Up. So we wish you all well. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.